So to bring, begin our discussion, our first speaker is Edward Lopez. Professor Lopez is Associate Professor of Law and Economics at San Jose State University. He's a research fellow at the Independent Institute. He's president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education. Before joining the faculty at San Jose State University in the fall of 2005, he held appointments at the University of North Texas and at George Mason University. He's also served as a staff economist on the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. His articles have appeared in many journals and books. And he's also editor, as I mentioned, of the new book, The Pursuit of Justice. Okay. Well, it's great to see so many uh, interested faces here um, this evening. <clears throat> Thank you, David, for that introduction, in particular, the substantive introduction. Um, to the material because it makes it easier to um, for me to uh, uh, describe <coughs> um, the book. Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, it's a real honor and a treat to uh, be here at the Independent Institute, especially um, in getting to share a panel with such uh, distinguished figures as Professor Friedman and Judge Kaczynski. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very happy to be here and, and thank you for all for coming tonight. I hope we have a good discussion. <clears throat> Um, as David was saying, The Pursuit of Justice it, uh, was published earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> it contains um, 11 original chapters, um, 11 original studies, by 15 scholars in economics, law, and politics. Uh, <clears throat> each of these papers looks at an area of the legal system that, uh, uh, and, and it looks at the, uh, these areas of the legal system using sort of the basic economic toolkit. Uh, if you will, um, <clears throat> the basic economic toolkit, especially of public choice economics. I should be clear about a few things as I start. Uh, you know, what is public choice? What is what do I mean by legal system? Um, by legal system, I mean generally the court system, and particularly the individuals who make decisions every day in the court system, including uh, police, prosecutors, judges, juries, forensics investigators, and so forth. Uh, and as for public choice, um, public choice theory is, began as an offshoot of economics to study politics. Uh, while, while, the, while, public, while the public choice um, toolkit has uh, traditionally focused on politics, political institutions, if you will, it, is also, uh, it has been also uh, increasingly applied um, to legal systems as well, to the courts. So the papers uh, in, in the book, um, these 11 new papers, um, <coughs> these 11 new papers, uh, <coughs> they, they, they continue this um, emerging uh, area of research and they push the envelope on it. And uh, in doing so, they shed new light on the role that incentives of these key decision makers in the law uh, play. What is the role that the incentives uh, facing judges, juries, <coughs> prosecutors, and so forth, um, what is the role of those incentives in determining and explaining um, the outcomes from the legal system, such as what David was uh, describing? So um, I think for uh, um, the, these, these uh, studies also pr give us a good foundation in looking at um, legal institutions uh, in a sort of realistic way, uh, they give us a good foundation for thinking about how to improve the legal system to improve the outcomes that it generates. And um, I think for this reason, one of the reviewers, uh, or the book has been described as being a realistic yet hopeful treatment of the legal system. And um, I think that captures well uh, what I view to be the dual or the twin purposes of, of the book. Um, this one, one, one purpose is scholarly, the book has a scholarly purpose. Um, the book has a reform purpose, and I think that for the, uh, those twin purposes make it an ideal fit for the Independent Institute. The scholarly purpose is to advance the study of law um, from the perspective of public choice theory, to draw attention um, by scholars to study the law in this way. The reform purpose is to use public choice to think through 
um, what are the systematic changes, what are the systematic uh, tendencies in the law, um, and especially reforming towards the depoliticization and the de-bureaucratization uh, of the legal system. So David was mentioning some of the problems that emerge. How do we know that, that there are problems with the legal system? Uh, well, because they manifest themselves pretty clearly. They manifest themselves in um, inefficiencies, or uh, that's what the economist, an economist would call it, wasted res wastes, uh, wasting of resources. And it also manifests in injustices or inequities um, that are generated by the legal system. Uh, and the, ele the 11 papers uh, in the book sort of take this sort of hard-nosed um, analytical approach to uncover these uh, things. Things like wrongful convictions, which David was mentioning, but also things like frivolous lawsuits that waste and redistribute wealth. Uh, things like prohibitively costly legal services <coughs> um, that lock out the poor. Uh, things like biased and, ad and inadequate access to uh, the courts themselves or to some form of arbitration or, or, or uh, dispute resolution themselves. And also, very importantly, um, political uh, and other types of interference in the judiciary to keep it from doing its job, to keep it from, um, uh, for example, uh, um, combating uh, corruption in the other branches of, of government, for example. Um, <clears throat> one of the papers looks at the, relationship, the empirical relationship between how independent is the judiciary and how corrupt is the government, uh, the other branches of government, uh, compared to that judiciary. So uh, the overall argument is that these are problems, of course, but they're not problems of personality. They're not problems of having the wrong person on the bench. Now, I, I would be um, pleased personally, myself, to have more Alex Kaczynski's on the benches of the judiciary. Uh, but I, I, uh, that's not the message of the book. The book is to look at these problems as systemic problems, as opposed to per problems of personality. Systemic problems that require not just throwing the bums out, but they require institutional reforms, changes to the way the legal system is set up. Changing the, the institutions of the legal system will alter the incentives of the key decision makers in the legal system to generate um, uh, improved outcomes. So that's kind of an over overview um, of what the uh, book's message is. Um, <clears throat> To give you a sense of the scholarly motivation, a little bit deeper sense of the scholarly motivation for the book, let me go behind the scenes <coughs> uh, to a little bit. This will help uh, also to ta set up our discussion about, um, uh, well, this will also help to sort of let me uh, review the contents of the book, which is kind of the main part of my talk um, tonight. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, the core approach of economic analysis is, of course, that incentives matter. People make their decisions based on the incentives that confront them. And as economics has been used to study more and more areas of life, not just markets and um, production, but uh, things like legislatures, schools, sports, churches, families, other types of um, areas of life that you, that, that you don't sort of uh, <coughs> automatically think of as being economic areas of life, they've been studied by economists. And what we've seen is that um, as the sort of steady progression of analysis in these areas of life goes on, we've seen this sort of consistent analytical theme emerge, and that is that, uh, as I was saying, this, the theme is regardless of the area of life that you're talking about, it's uh, the incentives that pertain to that situation are going to determine the outcomes there. And um, because incentives are wrapped up in, defined by, embedded in, whatever the institutional arrangements are of that area of life, um, we have that same situation. So in, in some sense, the law, the legal system is not um, uh, special. It uh, conforms to and is amenable to this more general form of analysis that you can use to study uh, institutions in any area of life. So it's a very general uh, approach, the scholarly motivation. But it's also a very important one to setting up the more specific discussions of the actual issues. It's important because of how ordinary people uh, view um, potentially reforming um, the legal system, uh, which may kind of um, lean towards this sort of throw the bums out um, or put caps on behaviors that we don't like or ba outright ban behaviors that we don't like, um, things like that. S uh, relatively simple, um, issue-specific, relatively narrow types of changes. The generality of the public choice approach lends itself more towards um, 
more general types of reforms, more systemic types of reforms as opposed to the specific. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> going on to the uh, sort of subject matter of the book, uh, <clears throat> bringing sort of front and center what the, what the problems are with the legal system, let me organize, I'll, I'll make five points basically. I'll organize the material into five points. Um, <clears throat> the first is that generally um, finding empirical evidence that the legal system um, serves uh, various sets of private interests as opposed to serving public interests. Um, there are some chapters in the book that, that are in that vein. So the law is meant to serve the public interest, yet too often it's driven to serve particularly, uh, particular uh, narrow interests instead. So one chapter in the book, it's actually the final chapter in the book uh, by a, um, a policy analyst, uh, uh, Adam Summers. Uh, Adam shows how the regulation of the supply of legal services, uh, traditionally it insulates lawyers from beneficial competition. And um, what that does is it decreases uh, the amount of legal services that are um, provided onto the market, which raises prices, which limits access by consumers, consumers of the law. Um, <clears throat> when, uh, and, and again, this is a sense in which the law is not really special. When, when markets have high barriers to entry, um, <clears throat> this generally harms consumers and raises the profits of the incumbent firms who enjoy the, the barriers to entry. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so uh, what Adam does is he looks at how uh, legal services are regulated to uh, erect barriers to entry and have these types of effects. Um, <clears throat> for example, so Adam writes that all 50 states require a person to obtain a license from the state in order to provide uh, most legal services. Um, of course, it works slightly differently in each state, but the licensure requirements are uh, um, basically getting a law degree from an industry approved school. Uh, passing the state bar exam written by the industry, being a member of the state bar association, paying various entry and license fees, taking continu continuing uh, legal education courses. In some states, you have to satisfy a moral character uh, determination. And interstate competition is limited by um, um, a general lack of reciprocity <coughs> among the states. If you're licensed in one, you can't practice in another. Um, restrictions on advertising are also in place in many states. The intention behind these restrictions is rather noble sounding. It's the old story that we want to protect consumers. But the effects of these restrictions are to decrease the supply of legal services, to essentially price many consumers out of the market, and to essentially quash competition from many uh, would-be competitors, from many people who might not have uh, a license to practice, but could he, who could easily and competently handle things um, like uh, wills or small, small claims um, cases, uh, certain types of contracts and such. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the, 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 this chapter in the book demonstrates how um, the institutional arrangements of competition for legal services um, reduces supply and that um, causes inefficiencies um, uh, in the form of um, uh, social costs. It also presents injustices in the, se in the form of um, um, falling heavier on uh, poor people. So in a parallel chapter, a law professor, Benjamin Barton, um, he's a law professor at University of Tennessee, he presents what he calls the lawyer-judge hypothesis. Um, the first, I'll just read the first sentence of Ben's chapter to sort of convey this hypothesis. Quoting, if there's a clear advantage or disadvantage to the legal profession in any question of law, judges will choose the route that benefits the profession as a whole. So Barton goes on to demonstrate an array of, uh, he's, one of he's a scholar who can sort of survey vast um, uh, areas of case law and sort of draw connections together that uh, other people uh, don't do as well. And he does this in this chapter. He goes on to demonstrate a lot of uh, an array of uh, areas of the law in which this lawyer-judge hypothesis seems to hold. Um, these include the law profession's generally broad powers to self-regulate. So there's a lot of overlap with the previous chapter I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but it also includes uh, the high degree of confidentiality ascri ascribed to um, the attorney-client privilege in the courts, which and, and um, Ben puts the, the research uh, together to make this point, the attorney-client privilege is held to be much stronger than um, privileges in other professions, say doctor-patient privilege, say clergy-penitent privilege, say accounting and so forth. 
And so that's one other area where he, where he uh, uh, teases this out. The lawyer-judge hypothesis draws, potential, uh, draws attention to the potential biases that may result. As, uh, uh, um, so for example, there's something called the merit plan um, by which judges are appointed and then um, subject to uh, uh, uncontested re-elections. Re now the re-elections are by, uh, uh, it varies by state, but generally in states that have the merit plan, it's a group of, uh, a subset of the, lo of the legal profession who's uh, voting, for the re voting for retention. So um, what this has the effect of is judges that are selected by the merit plan, there's evidence to, uh, to uh, conclude that they've been um, <clears throat> uh, ruling in favor more of lawyer in lawyers' interests on the margin. In other words, uh, when, uh, when, um, when there's a clear advantage or disadvantage to the legal profession, judges are ruling for the legal profession, ceteris paribus, all other things constant. So um, every one of the things I, I really uh, strived to do in the book was to have all the chapters uh, uh, discuss the reform implications. And the reform implications here uh, with these two chapters are uh, radical ones. They are to remove barriers to entry in the provision of legal services, and they are to make uh, legal services, uh, broadly speaking, lawyers and judges' services um, more like competitive markets and less like government monopolies. Um, that's the general reform uh, uh, message there. Second point, um, and it draws off the uh, ending of the first point, was judicial selection methods. Um, judges, re judges are people too. <laughs> judges respond to incentives, and no body of evidence suggests uh, this more strongly than the results, the empirical results on uh, judicial selection mechanisms. It turns out uh, about uh, half the states uh, have elections, about half the states do some form of appointment. Um, <clears throat> chapter three by economists uh, Russ Sobel, Josh Hall, and Matt Ryan uh, finds that the quality of the legal system is sensitive to how judges are selected. So uh, there's this data set that goes out and says, are you familiar with the legal system in state X? Um, if you say yes, then you can take this survey. And the survey is, what do you think about the legal system in state X? Well, it turns out that um, in um, the, the responses to these surveys, the quality is lower in elected states compared to appointed states. The quality is even lower in those states that elect by partisan elections as opposed to nonpartisan elections, right? Uh, and so there the reform um, message is fairly clear. Um, uh, at least um, do away with um, partisan elections for judges. There's some more evidence in the, in the, in the book, but in chapter six, by another pair of economists, Alexander Tomich and, and Jan Hicks. Um, this chapter uh, uses a, uh, in a very extensive data set of uh, judges' rulings on criminal cases. County level uh, data, 54 large population counties in the 1990s, uh, 70,000 cases. And they do some um, um, very uh, advanced econometric analysis uh, with this data set. And they find that elected judges have higher incarceration rates, but they issue shorter sentences compared to appointed judges. OK, so this is a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, but it's not so much a puzzle if you think about the incentives of the judges and who they're responding to, voters or um, uh, statewide um, uh, elected officials who appoint them. And it turns out that if you're responding to voters, then your uh, incentive is to treat the prison system like a fiscal commons, right? Every county can afford to be tough on crime um, and enjoy the benefits of that locally and send lots of people to, uh, uh, to prison, but then share in the costs of, in, of that incarceration with the other counties in the state. And so this is the basic reasoning behind um, this result. And again, I think it underscores the idea that the way that institutions are arranged, do you elect or appoint, that informs how people's incentives are set up, um, uh, fiscal commons or not. And that uh, leads to a clear explanation of the types of decisions they're making, um, uh, higher incarcerates, incarceration rates, but shorter sentences. Um, <clears throat> third. Uh, let market forces improve forensic science. So this is getting to David's uh, first point. So like political institutions and um, electoral incentives, what economists call, uh, would, what economists would call the industrial organization of the legal system um, also matters. In chapter four, <coughs> the economist uh, Roger Koppel 
invites us to innovate uh, cost-effective changes um, to easily prevent a lot of un, uh, a lot of wrongful convictions due to fingerprinting errors. <clears throat> the chapter is about fingerprinting. Turns out, fingerprinting uh, uh, before it went digital, I suppose, uh, was more uh, uh, sort of equal parts science and art. Um, <clears throat> and it has an error rate to it. Uh, I think is something about three percent is what he is what is being reported in the uh, chapter. So uh, false findings in fingerprinting lead to thousands of false convictions a year. Uh, about six thousand is Rogers count. Um, but the thing is, we're not handling the institutional arrangements don't handle this vulnerability of fingerprinting very well. We know there's a, a small error rate. Um, but the way fingerprinting analysis is set up is that while well, a forensics lab essentially is belongs to the county, it's not exactly a property situation, but um, a prosecutor in a police force uses a forensics lab for the most part, and that forensics lab is has a uh, you know, for the most part one client, and um, so you have this bilateral monopoly that characterizes uh, most of um, uh, that characterizes the the the, the, um, the market for forensics. Again, the message would be. Um, <clears throat> put in some uh, more competition of, uh, among forensics labs, but the message is a little bit more specific in this case as well. Uh, <clears throat> Roger says that if you, have, um, if, you, if you instill greater independence between the forensics labs and the prosecutors and police, that'll do a lot because there's a lot of uh, messaging that comes along when the evidence is submitted. We really care about this case. We don't care about this case, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, some contextual evidence is also kind of comes along the way. I was having a conversation at dinner earlier, and this point was brought up, that, uh, you know, what if the zip code of the defendant is on uh, the evidence and the forensics expert knows that that's a bad zip code? Uh, you can make some context, you know, that could be a contextual uh, bias uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> the point is to increase that independence between forensics science and um, the administration of the, of the courts. Uh, and then uh, Roger makes a, 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 an extra point saying that triplicate fingerprinting analysis <clears throat> would take this 3% and through the laws of conditional probability, you know, make it vanish vanishingly small. Uh, and he does some cost-benefit analysis. What are these extra tests going to cost us money-wise? Um, what are these extra tests going to, uh, um, you know, gain? how are we going to gain from it? Uh, only money-wise is what he's looking at. He's, he's looking at the reduction in incarceration costs. He doesn't even include uh, the non-money costs uh, gained by not incarcerating innocent people. Uh, but even by this conservative estimate of his, um, there's orders of magnitude difference between the benefits of this and the costs of it. All right, so the reform there is, is uh, fairly, fairly clear and obvious. More competition, more independence, and more, more testing. How am I doing? How am I doing on time, I should say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as, I was, as I said, uh, as I've been saying, you know, the sort of scholarly uh, pr purpose here is a general one, but um, we, uh, it, the, the, the chapters in the book cover a lot of different topic areas. So moving to the next topic area, um, eminent domain. There are, there are two and a half so, uh, sort of chapters uh, in the book on eminent domain. Um, and just to sort of set this up, uh, it's important to a couple of the chapter, to the chapters, um, <coughs> takings restrictions, restrictions on the takings power, uh, the public use requirement and the just compensation requirement, um, these um, <coughs> restrictions on the takings power had, had been sort of gradually eroded um, since the late uh, 19th century, accelerating in the progressive era in the New Deal as the Supreme Court, um, as the court system uh, increasingly deferred to legislatures, to legislative bodies, um, to define public use. And with this increasing deference to legislatures came this increasing um, breadth of the definition of public use. By the middle of the 20th century, the stage was set to, uh, for the court to green light takings um, for such uh, public uses as urban renewal programs, uh, Berman versus Parker, 1954. Uh, the, the divestiture of oligopoly power in real estate, that's the Hawaii housing uh, versus Midkiff case in 1984 that Judge Kaczynski and I were talking about before the, the session here. Uh, and then most uh, famously from our um, perspective in 2010, uh, Suzette Kilo's house in New London, Connecticut, um, uh, the takings power was okayed there to 
uh, <clears throat> uh, pr promote the, the public use of uh, economic development. All right. So uh, by the final decade of the 20th century, one prominent legal scholar uh, described the public use clause as being of nearly incomplete, uh, of nearly complete insignificance. And so it's sort of uh, in the hallways of law and economics departments, uh, it's become the public useless clause, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, what do you expect? State and local governments have made a routine uh, out of using the takings power to enhance their tax bases, to prop up inefficient, glitzy developments. Um, defenders of this power argue that the just compensation requirement is a sufficient deterrent um, to the overuse of takings. On the other hand, assessment disputes are heavily favored toward governments. Um, uh, governments uh, have heavier legal firepower. They also have consultants in a repeated game that they use uh, on a regular basis that, gen that develop uh, their human capital around winning these types of uh, assessment disputes. So that's, um, that's kind of the background. In Chapter 7, uh, an economist named John Bratland uh, argues that this very notion of just compensation is... Um, is a, uh, is a farce because there's no voluntary exchange um, taking place. There's no way for any um, unrelated party to say whether that was uh, just or not. The only way we can say if it's an ethical argument, the only way we can say if it's just or not is if the person voluntarily consented to that um, exchange. So the entire concept of just compensation is a flawed one, according to this, um, to this contribution. Another legal scholar, Ilya Soman, in Chapter 8, shows the adverse consequences of relying on eminent domain for economic development. It's very targeted at the kilo-style takings. Um, so he looks at a related case, uh, Poletown, Michigan. It's not a Supreme Court case. It's a Michigan um, um, Court of Appeals case. And, uh, but essentially, the characteristics are very similar. Um, it wasn't um, a, a, a couple of dozen houses. It was a pretty big neighborhood that was... Um, uh, wiped out and, and uh, made to make room for a General Motors <coughs> um, uh, assembly plant. Um, <coughs> so in the in cases like these, in in, in the Pole Town case, in the Berman versus Parker case, uh, urban renewal program from Washington D.C., uh, in the Kilo case, in these cases where the takings power uh, was used most expansively, um, Professor Soman's chapter shows that um, the results have been the most disastrous. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> with, uh, with a limited time, I'll just say, uh, give what, the one example. Five years and counting after the Supreme Court's decision in 2005 on uh, Kelo versus the city of New London, um, that parcel of land that the city acquired remains undeveloped. In 2009, a story emerged that the entire, you can see, by the way, sat on Google uh, Maps, if you do the satellite view, you can see this area of town. You can actually put in Suzette Kilo's old address and it'll show you where it is and you can see it's waterfront you can also see it's completely cleared and it's brown um, <clears throat> and in 2009 a story emerged that the entire neighborhood smelled of raw sewage so um, the the point is to um, to look at what are we what are we promising through the use of eminent domain what kinds of public benefits are we promising through the use of eminent domain, and what kind of public benefits actually do emerge? The evidence in this chapter is that where eminent domain has been used most expansively, have, we've had the most uh, disastrous failures of it. And then finally, um, the, law, the law being used as a means to redistribute wealth, which destroys wealth. Um, America's tort system costs a society upwards of um, 800 or 900 billion dollars a year in uh, higher um, prices for products and services. Higher product prices for products and services because companies face, uh, um, uh, uh, respond to the um, uncertainty of uh, product liability with um, <coughs> um, higher costs of production which leads to higher prices. So, uh, <coughs> Chasing in, in the tort system, when lawyers and judges have, have the incentive to, if, if they're chasing sort of the jackpot cases, the jackpot justice cases, um, lawyers and judges have the incentive to innovate uh, new ways to use the tort system to uh, redistribute wealth, which increases this, uh, this tort tax that I'm talking about. Um, so there's venue shopping, there's class padding, uh, those are nice. But um, there's nothing compared to what's been going on with the gradual expansion of the legal doctrine known as CPRE. 
Si pre uh, is French for, from, from what I've read anyway, it, it, um, it means roughly as close as possible or the nearest thing possible. It's a doctrine that goes back to um, <coughs> uh, uh, situations where a judge has a, um, an, a, a, an award, uh, a judgment, um, and cannot legally um, dispense that, that, that amount. Um, maybe it was, uh, it's a trust that the, um, that the person who wrote the trust says something, you know, do, do with my money something and it's illegal. Right. So in that case, the judge has to uh, issue the money uh, by this doctrine of C. Pray as close as possible as you can, as you can find out. So um, <clears throat> chapter 11 by um, law professor Charles Keckler um, shows that C. Pray has been increasingly used to empower judges to distribute award funds um, to their preferred charities. All right. So there's one case, typically the legal profession. There's one case in... Um, uh, in, in Illinois from a few years ago where uh, it was a light cigarettes um, advertising case. Philip Morris was the defendant, um, claimed that, uh, that, uh, that uh, they were misleading their consumers th through advertising that made them think that cigarette, light cigarettes were safer and healthy. So the, the, uh, the uh, damages were $10 billion, and um, the class was not easy to identify because who keeps their receipts for light cigarettes to show that they are a member of the class? Um, judge and lawyers uh, uh, on counsel from the uh, uh, from the uh, plaintiffs' attorneys. A judge decides to invoke C. Pray as close as possible. So in this case, what is as close as possible? Well, yeah, I'm done. Uh, well, <coughs> um, there was about after taxes and the plaintiffs' fees, plaintiffs' attorneys' fees. There was about 5.8 billion dollars left in the fund. 95% uh, of this went to the legal profession. The law schools in Illinois, the uh, the legal the, the bar, um, uh, legal aid, and um, one more. Uh, Three percent went to um, causes that you associate with smoking, anti-cancer uh, research, um, domestic uh, violence uh, programs, and so forth and so on. So this is one of the ways. This is uh, one of the ways that the, the book illustrates how the law is being um, not just used but increasingly used um, to redistribute wealth. So. Let me conclude because I'm probably over my time already, but so there are, these are the, basically the five categories where the pursuit of justice makes contributions to both scholarship and to uh, reform in society. So it's a realistic yet hopeful analysis by identifying those areas where decision makers in the law have bad incentives. Uh, we can better, uh, not only better explain the undesirable outcomes, but we're on better ground to recommend uh, systemic reforms, reforms that provide better incentives um, to, to generate uh, better outcomes from the legal services. So I hope um, that I didn't give everything away. I hope that you'll still um, buy the book tonight, uh, and, I'm, and uh, maybe more because, you know, hey, look, most stockings are bigger than this, and, you know, and it, it, it does kind of fold a little bit. Nice little stuffer. Um, thank you for having me tonight. I, I look forward to our uh, discussion and the other panelists. Thank you.